Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 22nd, 2021 meeting of the uh, State Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel, live from uh, Town Hall in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, we're just going to do the roll uh, to begin. Uh, my name is John Mahoney. I'm a selectman appointment, a select board appointment for the community of Plymouth. Ms. Dubois. We're having a little feedback. I'm sorry. Better. Okay. Are, is your laptop fine? Is it is muted, it, Rich? Is it muted? Is it muted? No. Hold on. 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 Hold on.
I know that Jack Priest also uh, sent me a uh, change to the um, to the minutes. Jack, can you can we hear you if you speak? Yes, you can. Um, I have reading his email. So in the original, um, in the original, in reference to um, Ms. Who's that? That's Dave and one. I was trying to fix the problem. Oh, oh. So Ms. Lampert also raised the issue of a, uh, what the minutes read is Ms. Lampert also raised the issue of a template for panel questions. She stated that Mr. Priest had also offered to work with Mr. Lampert to create an amalgamated template for questions to send to the endicap chairs. However, this has not been completed. Mr. Priest stated that he is not the secretary for the panel and that another member could volunteer to do that. Ms. Lampert volunteered to take on this task. Mr. Mahoney stated that he and the vice chair would take the issue under advisement. Uh, Jack would like to change the minutes to read. Ms. Lampert also raised the issue of a template for the panel questions. She stated that Mr. Priest had offered to work with Mr. Lampert and a draft an amalgamate, amalgamated, uh, you know what I mean, template for questions to send to the endicap chairs was submitted. Although a template was provided, a final approved document has not been completed. Mr. Priest suggested that other panel members could be engaged and a member could volunteer to do that. Ms. Lampert volunteered to take on this task. Mr. Mahoney stated that he and the vice chair would take the issue under advisement. I would move that we accept the change of uh, um, Mr. Priest. And yourself, or you want to? Uh, and obviously the ones that I made. Second. Second. Um, could you clarify actually what you decided? What, what? What's this one? I guess you want to clarify what the change was with respect to Mr. Priest? Yeah, I don't frankly know where we're at right now. We're at the on the minutes, but I don't know where in the minutes that is. So I'm going to have to find it and plug it in, Mary. It was just mm -hmm. a little bit of language that uh, Mr. Priest was asking for clarification for because he was um, mentioned several times in that as you were. Mm -hmm. I, I think the question is, what's the status of the uh, Jack, I product. still can't hear. Can you repeat where in the minutes, if you can? I I don't have that in front of me. I okay. think Barry's question is, what's the status of the template? Well, let's just get the minutes fi fixed first, and then we can talk about that later. I've got them. I just don't know where the thing is. There's a motion on the floor, Chair. Yeah, all right, so we got a motion on the floor with respect to a couple of amendments with respect to the minutes. So all those in favor of the minutes as amended? Aye. One, two, three, four, five. Five up there and how many down here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 11. Seven and five. 11. Seven and five is 12. 12. <laughs> That's why you do the math, right. chair. All right, it's unanimous. Uh, oh, anyone opposed to the minutes as amended? Okay, all right, it's unanimous. Uh, apparently 12 to nothing. Oh, I found it. It's. Uh... You wanna go into this now? No, let me just, let, no, let me just clarify for the minutes. That it's on page seven. Uh, lines 18 through 22 are being replaced. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all, set. Yep. all right, moving on to agenda item number three, we have a CDI Pilgrim uh, Holtec decommissioning update from Mr. Patrick O'Brien. Thank you, everyone. Provide. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, while we're waiting for the setup on that, uh, when can I expect that the uh, November minutes will be published? Uh huh. You, it, the annual report goes to November 30th. You mean the minute 
Rich, the minutes from tonight? Tonight. I would suggest that, uh, Rich, that we have to look at the recording and do them ourselves. Thank you. Okay, we're good? All right. Uh, good evening. I'll provide the update for uh, plant progress since our last meeting. Uh, the usual uh, timeline is still up there. We're on track and, and moving along. With regards to the fuel campaign, that's been uh, the critical path and most uh, important project we've been working on. Uh, 31 of 34 casts are completed for this campaign, which means that 59 of 62 total casts have been loaded. Uh, the cast loading will resume after the Thanksgiving holiday. We've given the crew uh, this week off uh, to go and uh, spend some time with their families. Uh, 47 casts have been transferred to the upper asphyxi pad, uh, and we are on track to complete uh, everything by December 10th with all fuel up to the upper asphyxi. Uh, greater than Class C non-fuel waste containers, three of those are on schedule and they will follow the fuel campaign. Uh, we have some scheduled demolition uh, that we're working through right now with the outbuildings. Uh, the FFD medical building, the abatement started on that building on the 19th of this month uh, and demolition scheduled uh, to occur after the holiday on uh, the, the 8th of December. Uh, the uh, O&M building, uh, the abatement will begin early December and with projected demolition uh, middle of December or beginning demolition. Uh, the old executive building will be doing the abatement there uh, early January with demolition in February and the two story Butler building will working through the abatement there uh, in January. Uh, we continue to work in parallel uh, with reactor segmentation. Really the key part of this is uh, we continue to crush riser tubes. Uh, we've completed 95, 154 uh, riser tubes uh, and we'll be placing those inside the BC waste boxes uh, for eventual shipment. Uh, I think the only other thing that's key on this is uh, post um, uh, GTCC, so greater than class C waste, we'll be uh, working on packaging and disposing of the spent fuel racks once the pool's empty. Waste management, we continue to uh, you know, move waste at a, at a pretty good clip off site. Uh, we have over 2 million pounds to date uh, of waste that has been transported to our uh, facility or our uh, partner's facility in Texas. Uh, we've done uh, a number of different movements and we'll continue to do that uh, into 2022. I'm gonna ask Dave Noyes just to speak to this first uh, slide on environmental about uh, an incident that occurred at the site. Dave. Thanks, Pat. On uh, November 9th, uh, we reported a violation of the facility's NEPDES permit to the US EPA and Mass DEP. Uh, the violation had occurred the previous day when uh, approximately 7,000 gallons of rain and groundwater uh, had been uh, pumped from an underground cable vault to an adjacent storm sewer uh, that attaches to one of the plant's uh, permitted outfalls in the discharge canal. Uh, made a corresponding report to the USNRC um, due to an environmental report being uh, made to a government agency. Uh, the water was non-radiological, uh, no visible sheen or odor were noted. Uh, laboratory analysis is in progress. Uh, we expect to have that back by the middle of next week. Uh, we're performing a causal analysis uh, to determine what process and performance breakdowns contributed to the event. Thanks, Dave. Uh, site characterization, uh, Mr. Drabinski, do you have a, would you like to take a minute and weigh in on this, please? Sorry, folks, I was on mute. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, all the analysis and um, sampling has been completed. We're waiting on the results of the analytical data from the laboratories and hope to uh, get the information available to us by middle of December. And then based on that, we will determine whether we have additional reporting requirements or not. But uh, the, all the field activities are completed and we're currently waiting for the analytical data to be delivered to us. Thank you. Yeah. And the final piece, um, we are having uh, another site staff reduction uh, that's planned for January 6th. Uh, we held a job fair last week uh, for those uh, that will be displaced. It's roughly 70 employees that will be leaving the site. 
Uh, we've been working really hard with the local employers to identify opportunities for those leaving site uh, and did have a good turnout with, uh, with Clean Harbors, the Sheriff's Department, TSA, the Chamber of Commerce, which represents 750 businesses, Eversource, and then BHI and Williams, which provide contract labor support back to the site uh, for a number of those individuals. So we're working to, to ensure that everyone um, you know, has some placement that wants to be placed. Uh, there are a number of employees that uh, will look to retire at that point as well, similar to other times we've done separations. And that's all I have for an update. Go ahead, Rich. Rich? Patrick, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, regarding the canisters that are gonna go in the upper pad, two have been scheduled for class waste. Three. Three, excuse me, all right. Those are not part of the fuel campaign necessarily, are there? And if not, or if so, when will they go to the uh, upper pad? Uh, they are to follow the fuel campaign. And I believe, and Mr. Moylan can correct me, we scheduled to have those three canisters up there by January or in January? At the end of January, beginning of February. Okay, thanks, John. I didn't hear what he said. End of, end of January, early February. In January 2022? Yes. So all three canisters will be at the pad on 2022, January. Yes. January, early February is what he said. So it's all part of the fuel campaign. Thank it's, you. It's, it's after fuel campaign. All the fuel will be up there by December 10th. And we'll load the GTCC in the in the building and the non-fuel waste containers we brought out after that. Thank you very much. Yep. Patrick, uh, can we go back to the first slide? I think which was the uh, the timeline for the uh, fuel. Sure. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. The next, you passed it. Sorry, this one. Right there. Yep. All right. So we're going to resume after Thanksgiving. All right. So fuel came in December 10th. Okay, all right, so everything's out of the significant uh, milestone. Obviously. Yeah, 90, right now we currently have 95% of the fuel that has ever been at Pilgrim cast. 95% of the fuel that has ever been used at Pilgrim is now in a cask. Okay, uh, soon to be completed by uh, December 10th. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the pool, the water upon completion of that Sure, That's I'll ask, uh, I'll ask uh, either John or Dave to speak to that directly, uh, where, where, what our timeline is and what our steps are post uh, emptying the pool. I'll start. We, um, we still have some um, components in the pool. So we'll do the GTCC campaign and then we'll have a campaign to uh, eliminate some of the other components that are uh, still reside in, in the pool. So that's going to take some time. It's going to take us at least into the fall of 2022. And at that point, um, the site will uh, make a decision on disposition in that water. Um, and we have many paths and processes we can invoke. Um, we haven't finalized that yet. Um, and we can store the water in our Taurus, or we can leave the water as is but we have not made that um, decision yet. John, the first option was when you could store the water where? In we have um, a torus, it's a, it's a suppression ring. It's, it's a large volume. Um, it's not necessarily a tank, but it was uh, designed for um, a repository for, for liquids and water and was used in, in some of our accidents basis. So, there's some room in there we could put it but like i said we have not finalized um the final disposition of of the water yet you have how many uh, two to four options in front of you as far when it comes to this or two you have numerous options when it comes to we have options Wait, for you... water yes what you can ship, you can overboard, depending on, you know, what, what the- Or, or evaporate. Yeah, okay. evaporate, which we've done a lot of. Well, you have a million gallons- Correct. Uh, to deal with. Correct. No, a million. We've evaporated, what have we evaporated since we started the fuel campaign, John? It's a large quantity. Yeah, I don't have the number in front of me yeah. to quote it. It, it's evaporated in the building and it gets treated through, you know, it goes through the, the filtering system for the, for the buildings, yes. 
we've been doing that all along through the fuel campaign. Uh, Mary? Uh, yes, I understand the real options are to put it in Cape Cod Bay or to truck it. Uh, if you were to truck as they decided to do at Vermont Yankee, where would you truck it to? And what would be, considering Alara, et cetera, what would be your reason not to truck it? John, I don't, I don't know offhand where it would go. I don't know what our deal with WCS is related to water. Yeah, there's, um, there's vendors out there that would process water. We have not vetted any of them yet to talk about volumes, nor trucks or the volumes of the trucks, et cetera, et cetera. That plan has not been finalized yet. Patrick, the buildings that you uh, currently have scheduled to come down, uh, I think you outlined like four of them in the next few months. Yep. Um, so we're still, uh, these aren't very complicated. The abatement is pretty much what uh, lead paint and asbestos. Asbestos, majority of, I believe is asbestos. I don't know of any lead paint off. Maybe some PCBs, John. But we're not getting into radiological. No, 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 no. Yeah. These are all out buildings. So these are outside of the radiological footprint. Right. And so the combined, these four buildings, what's um, the footprint? Do you have a square footage on those? Ooh, uh, the warehouse is probably, the O&M the building warehouse is probably the largest on that. Um, I don't have the, the square footages. We can get those offhand. The old exec and two-story butler and FFD are relatively small buildings. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, after these four, are you still, uh, they're going to get more complicated or are they still kind of some of the, uh, no, we'll still look to continue to do outbuildings, uh, at that point, uh, the radiological buildings will come at a, at a later point. And that's, you know, John may want to speak to it, but, um, you know, once we get fuel on pad, you know, we'll, we'll take the time to do the planning related to those buildings. So that's a little further down the timeline. 23. Uh, I don't have it. What is it offhand, John? Do you know? I don't um, think the... Yeah, we, we need to do our, our pre-demo surveys and um, partner with the state for the necessary permitting. But um, internal, um, it'll be um, iterative process. So um, there may be some in uh, 20 uh, next year, but um, it would probably be um, a lot more going on in, in 23. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. O'Brien? Um, John Moylan, can you tell me what the process for testing that water is going to be, the, the stuff in the pool, and what the decision triggers are and who's involved with that? Um, fine, I'll be purely on, on how we disposition it, but obviously we look for uh, the, what the concentration of nucleides are there um, in that water, and also the, the chemical uh, constituents that are in there. And uh, once those are determined, that will drive us to um, what processes um, we have available to us to, uh, to clean that water up and to disposition it. Thanks, and you'll obviously keep us informed, right? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Th thanks very much. I, didn't, I wasn't able to hear clearly before, so thanks for repeating if you did. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, uh, update from Mr. Seth Pickering on IWG activities on decommissioning. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start my update with an announcement that um, Samantha Phillips um, has left uh, MEMA and is no longer uh, the director. Uh, Don Brantley will be serving as the acting MEMA director moving forward. And she has designated John Viveros, uh, who's the head of uh, the MEMA Technical Hazards Unit, uh, to serve as her designee on the Endicap. John was planning on being here um, this evening, but he's not, uh, he wasn't able to attend. Can, can um, you repeat, repeat who's taking your place, please? I'm sorry? Who is taking uh, Sam's place? John Viveros. 
who, he, here at who has attended meeting? Yeah, he's attended meetings in the past. Right, but who who at MEMA? Uh, Don Brantley is going to be the acting okay. MEMA director. So John has served as the lead radiological planner for Pilgrim Station for over 17 years um, and post shutdown. MEMA will continue to conduct quarterly uh, work group meetings uh, with the former emergency planning zone communities and will uh, be the main point of notification for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to the Commonwealth. I just uh, just have a plea. Uh, the, the audio in here is terrible. Yep. So if you could work harder yep. to... Enunciate. Enunciate. It would. Be I can do that. I can do it louder too, Pine, if you want me to. We're, we're all having problems with better? our ears, apparently. Is that better? Okay. So um, we'll move on to the DEP stuff um, and the DPH stuff at this point. So DEP and DPH are continuing to work with the Attorney General's Office um, to uh, formulate a formal response on the site, assess site assessment work plan. Um, and it will be provided shortly to Holtec uh, and the uh, Endicap will get a copy um, just as soon as we send one uh, to Holtec as well. Um, let's see, uh, an update from today. Uh, I sent a, a letter to Pine uh, that uh, uh, came from the Attorney General's office sent a letter today uh, informing Holtec um, that it's in non-compliance with paragraph 24 uh, of the Commonwealth Settlement Agreement, uh, which required Holdtech to undertake commercially reasonable efforts to evaluate barge shipment of solid, hazardous, and low-level radioactive waste, uh, and in any event to submit a radioactive waste management plan for review and approval by MEMA, DPH, and DEP. The Attorney General's Office has requested that Holtec comply with the Radioactive Waste Management Plan um, within 14 days to submit that to the AGO within 14 days and the barge study within 30 days of the date of the document that was dated today. I, I sent it to Pine, it's a public document, so. I'll send it around. I just got it at after four today, so we were on a. Another call. Just showed up this afternoon. Yeah, this it was late this afternoon, but I would definitely send it around right after the meeting or before we leave, in fact. Hmm. Yeah, Good. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say we will be responding. Um, one thing we, we don't agree on is there was no dates. Yes, there's, there were no dates in the agreement on when those were due. So we do have those documents. We will provide them. I, I didn't get that, Patrick. Sorry. I said we will, we will be responding. I said, um, you know, we did get that today. Uh, we, you know, we We'll respond. There were no specific dates in the agreement that required those to be submitted. So that's, but we do have those documents. We will provide them. So Pat, this is Jack. Patrick, part of our concern is that although no dates were submitted, some of those processes are ongoing. So why would we not get a plan and a strategy before you started doing the tasks? I understand where you come from, Jack. I'm just saying from you know, agree to disagree on it, but straight up, there were no dates. So we'll get those. We, you know, we're willing to respond and we'll have that information to you guys shortly. Good on that. Okay, so I'm going to move into um, an area that's already been discussed some um, to follow up on the report out on the uh, uh, MPDES uh, permit uh, unauthorized dis discharge that occurred on November 8th. Uh, the department and uh, US EPA were notified of an unauthorized discharge from Pilgrim's electrical vault system, um, which is regulated by the MPDES permit, uh, which was jointly issued by DEP and EPA. Uh, our agencies are currently investigating and each will respond accordingly. As was noted in the whole tech presentation, uh, there, there's testing being done uh, on the effluent that was discharged uh, and so we'll be uh, getting those results when they come back and we will be taking a look at how that compares to um, you know what's allowed by the permit um, and on another item that has already been um, mentioned uh, moving forward 
EPA, MassDPH, and MassDEP have been notified by Holtec um, that it is planning to uh, dewater the reactor and steam generation systems, and including the spent fuel pool um, that contain radioactive water. Uh, this includes water from the reactor vessel in the spent fuel pool and other components of the plant. The power plant components to be dewatered contain approximately a million gallons of radioactive water. Mass DEP and US EPA um, have uh, made uh, the company aware that any discharge of pollutants regulated under the Clean Water Act uh, contained within spent fuel cooling water into the ocean through Cape Cod Bay is not, not authorized by the NPDES permit. Um, radioactive substances are excluded from the definition of pollutant under the Clean Water Act and are regulated by the NRC. Um, Holtec has indicated that if it does discharge the radioactive water uh, into Cape Cod Bay, it will be done in batches of approximately 20,000 gal 20, gallons each. Um, the Pilgrim Station facility currently holds uh, a, a current MPDES permit for allowable discharges of water into Cape Cod Bay by the facility. Um, Holtec may choose to submit a formal dewatering discharge plan uh, submittal that will include its analysis of MPDES permit applicability for this proposed discharge or evaluate other disposal, disposal options as was dis discussed earlier. For further dis uh, consideration by Mass DEP, EPA, and Mass DPH, uh, if the agencies receive a formal request to discharge into Cape Cod Bay, including sufficient analytical information to make a determination, uh, then EPA, DPH, and MassDEP would review and provide a determination to Holtec on the applicability of the MPDES permit on the proposed discharge. Any questions about that? Mrs. Lambert? Uh, yes. Uh, about tritium, how can that be handled? You just uh, would Holtec plan to put it in Cape Cod Bay, drip it out in very, very small batches because cleanup, for example, in the pool uh, with resins and stuff like that can't uh, clean up the tritium, I understand. And so what would be the plan? So we're, we're looking at um, compliance with the MPDES permit. I don't believe tritium is listed as uh, a regulated pollutant in the, in the NIPTES um, mm -hmm. permit. So there's that part, but then, you know, we are going to have to see what um, the plan actually ends up being and what would be included um, in the discharge in terms of radioactive material uh, and go from there. That's not a mass DEP function. I, I could ask Jack for a little uh, input on that if he wishes to do so at this point. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so radionuclides, radioactivity concentration are controlled by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission following, uh, there's a couple of reg guides uh, related to that and uh, for the control of radioactivity and the release of radioactivity into the environment. I'm unaware of a filtering mechanism for tritium. Thank you, that was the point. So yeah, just for clarification, what I understand is that neither radionuclides nor tritium are included under the Massachusetts DEP and, D, um, and EPA so. as, a, as pollutants. And they're only under the jurisdiction of the NRC. Is that correct then? That's correct. So tritium is a radionuclide. It's not separate. Yes, okay, I, I do one know of, that. One of many. So by definition of pollutants by uh, the EPA and the Clean Water Discharge Act, uh, it does not include radionuclides as a pollutant. The radionuclides are under the regulatory authority of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission.
convenient that we have five NRC staffers here tonight. Okay, so we good on that one? Okay, so uh, other uh, issues uh, as, as updates, as previously reported, uh, MassDEP is continuing to work with Holtec on response actions related to the notice of responsibility uh, that was issued back in May of 2021 pertaining to the releases of PFAS uh, and some metals. Um, the company has one year to complete response actions um, related to these releases. Uh, so uh, moving forward, we're gonna continue to work uh, with Holtec on that. Um, Holtec's investigation into potential sources of PFAS is ongoing. Uh, Dred, do you wanna add anything else to that at this point? Well, just a clarification, they actually have one year to either clean up or at that point they would have to tier classify and initiate comprehensive response actions, which can take uh, much longer. Um, as we've discussed, I believe in previous meetings, it, it may be that the metals go away if they were more an artifact of the sediment in the groundwater. Um, it's gonna be difficult for the PFAS to be addressed within the first year. So it's likely that that will be tier classified. Correct, John? That's, that's correct, um, Gerard, that you're absolutely spot on. And I don't think we'll be closing out uh, the site in one year, you're correct. No. no. Thank you, appreciate it. That, uh, let's see, so uh, in my area, the DEP camp, um, the asbestos section is actively engaged in overseeing the demolition activity that's going on um, at the site. And it's meeting regularly with the company to manage the asbestos discovery, identification, uh, abatement, and ultimate removal and disposal uh, of, of asbestos, uh, with the, including the proper notifications and required approvals from SDEP. So uh, that process is going well at this time. Um, the visual barrier um, for the ISFISI um, is uh, the review for that is on MassDEP and the Southeast region at this point. We are reviewing a hydro study that was required um, by the department as part of an application for an amendment to the plant's wastewater treatment license. We talked about this briefly at the last endicap, but now the study that needs to be reviewed uh, for the hydrology is on is in the regional office. We need to review that um, so that we can um, give Holtec guidance on how to move forward on uh, submitting an application to modify um, the existing wastewater treatment plant at the facility. Uh, as part of um, the screening process, a, a number of uh, existing leach pits at the facility need to be removed. Uh, and so this process uh, for modifying the uh, a water pollution control permit needs to be done. Let's see, uh, and then the NDCAP annual report. Pine, uh, we will provide uh, bullets highlighting uh, work performed in 2021 uh, relative to implementation of the whole tech settlement agreement and our decommissioning activities. So I'll work with you on that um, in the next couple of weeks. Could you, Seth, repeat that for Rich? Rich sure. over here. Steve. Yep. Rich is yeah. working on the annual report, so he's the. So, Rich, I can uh, interact with you directly uh, if you'd like uh, on, on that. We're, the IWG, the uh, um, interagency working group, will prepare a list of bullets that have, that will highlight our work that's been performed in 2021 relative to the implementation of the settlement and and the decommissioning activities that have been ongoing. And I think you said within the, and and I think he said within the next couple of weeks he'll have it to you, okay? Uh, just to clarify, I need two portions. One is the uh, uh, IWG report, and the other is the site characterization DPH. I'm sorry. What was the first one? <laughs> IWG. IWG. Yeah. And then he said site characterization. So why don't, why don't offline, why don't, why don't we talk so I make sure that you, you, you get what, what it is that you need. I'll be glad to do that with you. That's what I have. 
Any questions for Mr. Pickering? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You want to give me to that again? I'm going to uh, we'll be going to agenda item this number five, uh, the NRC. I'm going to allow, uh, I'm not allow, I'm just going to ask Ms. Dubois to uh, set the stage here. So I want to, I want to welcome and thank uh, the NRC staff from Region 1 for, for uh, joining us tonight. We have um, five different staff members. Um, uh, and I, Amy, I will let you go first and introduce your team, I guess, or Bruce, who, who if you think somebody else is better suited to that, and then you can introduce what you all do there, and then if you wouldn't mind addressing those, uh, those items that have been, oh, and you have a presentation, how terrific. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tamara Bloomer. I'm the new deputy director for the Division of Radiological Safety and Security out of NRC's Region 1. Um, I'll be starting the presentation today, <clears throat> excuse me, and introducing a couple of our staff members. Um, so the Division of uh, Radiological Safety and Security is home to all the regional activities for medical and industrial radiological inspection, decommissioning, uh, in decommissioning inspections and emergency preparedness and security inspections. I have a couple of pictures here just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we've been seeing. Um, as you see on the left is the reactor vessel head. This is not Pilgrims, this is a different reactor vessel head, I think, um, with two of our inspectors. And that on the right is another site in active decommissioning, Vermont Yankee. One of our four branches is responsible for conducting decommissioning inspections. Harry, and I'm gonna get his name wrong, I'm sorry, Harry, Anagostopoulos is one of my staff members and he'll talk about the inspection program in a bit uh, more detail. Amy Snyder is here with us from headquarters Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Security. She will discuss uh, some of the licensing actions that are proposed and are or are completed. Um, and then Bruce Watson is also with us. He's the chief of the reactor decommissioning branch. I also have Neil here, who is our um, press. Uh, lastly, just another couple of pictures to give you an idea of the kinds of activities that we inspect and that are going on. On the left is a photo of the dry cast loading at Pilgrim. And then on the right is um, preparing an ISFACY pad, which was long ago completed at Pilgrim. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy. Tamara, thank you. You're, you're still muted, Amy. I think, I think it's just on your end, you have to unmute your computer. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm, can you, do you see my screen? Um, I see the gallery from your computer. Yep. But I don't see a presentation by you. I see Let what you're watching. Work. I see, I see that you're watching us. Okay. Give me a second, please. Sure. Uh, your us Share screen. 
entire screen. Amy, open up your presentation first and yeah. then hit share screen. Thanks, Jack. Okay. <sighs> yeah, we are Zoom challenged. We typically use Microsoft Teams, so we apologize. So open it up. It, it is opened, but I don't know. <laughs> Hit share screen. Share screen on the bottom of the. Yep. If you move your cursor, you should have a bar with a menu and you have a green button that says share screen. Okay, window, there it is. Can All you right. see my presentation? There you yes. go. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good, after, uh, good evening, this is Amy Snyder. I'm, the, uh, I'm a senior project manager at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and I'm the project manager for the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. And I'd like to um, give you an overview of the licensing actions completed over the last year. We've done an um, acceptability review for the quality assurance plan. Holtec wanted to um, change their plan to uh, their quality assurance plan to cover the fleet approach. And that required us to review that plan for acceptability. So they submitted that plan for um, Oyster Creek and Pilgrim combined, and so we reviewed that separately. Amendments that were completed this year, um, Holtec submitted applications for amendments for physical security plan, and that specifically dealt with changing their strategy for the physical security plan to deal with moving the spent fuel from the spent fuel pool onto pad one, and then to the haul path onto the new ISFACY pad. So that uh, we approved that in May of um, 2021. They also submitted applications for ISFACY only status, specifically the technical specifications. Earlier, um, they had a uh, amendment for technical specifications that removed requirements for the operating uh, reactor. Um, now, at this point, they submit an application to remove the technical requirements for maintaining the spent fuel pool. There are also a amendment for physical security that addresses ISFACI only status and the same thing for emergency preparedness. All three of these ISFACI only amendments were approved this year. They become effective once we receive written notification from Holtec that all of their spent fuel is on ISFACI to the new ISFACI pad, and they have 90 days to um, implement the ISFACI only plan. We also submitted an exemption this past year from um, Appendix uh, G of 10 CFR Part 20. And that specifically has to do with uh, receipt of waste shipment. The regulations require that if the, um, they do not get a receipt of destination to the location for radioactive waste that within 20 days, they need to uh, report to the NRC and investigate. They um, asked for a change uh, an exemption from 20 days to 45 days and we granted that exemption um, recently. Okay, so the future licensing is the big, uh, next big thing is the license termination plan application. And Holtec estimates that they'll be submitting that plan in the fall of 2025 with um, an anticipated license termination of the site, except the ISFACI by 2027. So the submittal, they also shared with us that they um, hope to submit that application sooner. Um, and they're, they're planning for unrestricted use 
um, except for the independent spent fuel storage and installation or the ISPACY. That has to be, um, that will be de decommissioned once the fuel is removed and that's a separate licensing action. The license termination plan must, uh, must include per regulation, which is in 5082, specifically they need to send in in their application a site characterization um, a discussion of what is remaining to be dismantled and how they plan on doing that. Plans for remediation, uh, detailed plans for the final status survey and that's important. So it's the strategy for final status survey and the cleanup criteria. Um, also the cost update on any remaining cost estimates um, and a supplement in their environmental report describing any new information or significant environmental change associated with their proposed termination activities. And finally, um, per the regulation, they're required to identify parts, if any, of the facility or the site that were released for use before approval of the license termination plan. And um, some sites have done that. And if they have, if sites do that, then they have to incorporate that into their strategy for final termination. Next Amy, slide. Could you tell us, Amy, could you tell us what a, could you just go back to that slide for a second? Could you okay. tell us what a significant environmental change is or an example? Um, a significant environmental change would be one that's not bounded or by the past environmental reviews uh, or licensing actions, the generic environmental impact statement um, for decommissioning, or that that was discussed in the post shutdown activities report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I can give you an example. Um, if they're going to propose barging and that wasn't discussed in the uh, post shutdown activities report um, and they actually plan on doing that, um, they would have to discuss that and we would have to evaluate that and decide if an environmental assessment would be needed. But right now we understand that they are just in the, um, they told us that they were required to do an assessment based on whether it would be realistic or feasible to do barge transport. And at the time when, when we found out about that, I had, did mention that, that that could be a potential area if they do decide to actually do that, that they would have to um, address that. Okay, next slide. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, license termination plan application. Um, if we accept the license termination application, we, we have a process for that and review it. It's an administrative review to see if all the pieces and parts are there. If we accept it for a detailed technical review, then we notice that acceptance in the federal register. And with that, we notice an opportunity for public comment on the application for us to consider in our review and an opportunity for hearing. We also will hold a public meeting in the vicinity of the plant and um, the staff will review will consist of a technical safety review and also an environmental review. And here I, I won't, um, you can read the guidance, but this guidance here is useful because it it lays out what the staff will, um, the, the information, the first one is what information the licensee needs to provide in the license termination plan. The second reference is guidance on um, how the staff would evaluate that plan. And the fourth reference is guidance on, um, additional guidance on unrestricted release as far as um, cleanup criteria. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Harry, who's going to do an overview on uh, inspection that we do for decommissioning. I have one question, Amy, quickly. Uh, NURAG 1757, Volume 2, 
is there a, is there a draft that is expected to be approved between now and 2025 when they would be providing this uh, document to the NRC? Um, I guess I guess I'm asking which what would be bounding the volume two or the draft if it's uh, approved. Um, whatever is, uh, th these aren't bounding because they're guidance documents. And from what I understand, the re there is a draft that's out and it provides more specific details on lessons learned from the past and it provides some flexibility as far as how um, things have been shown to be acceptable. So um, it, it, there's no requirement, it's a guidance document, which um, is to show one or more ways that have been found to be acceptable in the past. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy, before you go, can I get you to promise to send me this slideshow so that we can post it online? Yes, ma'am, I sure will. Thank you, thanks very mm -hmm. much. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Harry to continue. Okay, folks, uh, Amy, how's that? Can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'll go through uh, my slide presentation fairly rapidly so that there's time for some questions. My name is Harry Anagnostopoulos. I work out of Region 1. I'm a senior health physicist. I'm a certified health physicist and also a certified safety professional. And so uh, while we're on site, we do also look at industrial safety issues if something catches our attention. Uh, what I'm gonna do is provide an overview of our inspection program, do a review of typical inspection activities, and then very quickly talk about results to date in the inspection program. The program is described in Inspection Manual Chapter 2561, which is publicly available for everybody. Uh, our goal or our uh, mission is to complete a set of core inspections every year. Uh, and those core inspections are described in the Inspection Manual Chapter 2561. We add other inspections as needed to the inspection program for the year. And I think it's important to point out that the inspection manual chapter uh, is flexible in that the program shifts its focus and it shifts resources based upon the plant condition and the stage of decommissioning. So the types of inspections that we do and the amount of focus uh, that each inspection area gets uh, varies depending on the stage of decommissioning. And an example of that would be is, you know, fairly soon all of the fuel will be uh, removed from the spent fuel pool. And at that point, the amount of inspection hours we give to that inspection procedure will uh, drop and we will focus more attention on other areas. Here are the titles of the core inspection procedures that we complete every year. And I'll go through, through, through those very quickly just so you get a flavor of what it is that we look at. And uh, of course you can read these along with me. We look at safety reviews, design changes and modifications. We look at problem identification and resolution or the licensees corrective action program. As I mentioned, we, looked at, we look at spent fuel pool maintenance, surveillance and safety. We look at the fire protection program. We look at decommissioning performance and the status updates that the site provides on their decommissioning. Of course, we look at occupational radiation exposure and uh, our decommissioning inspectors are health physicists. So this is our uh, area of specialty. We look at radioactive waste treatment and effluent and environmental monitoring. We look at solid radioactive waste management and the transportation of radioactive materials. And then where appropriate, we look at remedial action surveys and final status surveys. Some examples of additional inspections that we've completed at Pilgrim so far. We took a look at the 10 CFR part 37 material security programs. 
We took a look at material control and accounting at decommissioning nuclear power reactors. This is the accounting of special nuclear material. We looked at the pre-operational testing of an independent spent fuel storage installation. We looked at the operation of an independent spent fuel storage installation. And uh, milestones based as needed, we do security inspections. For example, we completed an inspection of the new IFC pad to make sure that it was ready to receive fuel. And we do emergency preparedness inspections. At a high level, uh, we do not just inspect um, the Pilgrim site uh, quarterly when we are on site, we also inspect it almost continuously. So here's some examples of the things that we do. Uh, I review plant status reports from the operations department on a daily basis. We review the issue reports that are written as part of the corrective action program about two times a week. We attend a decommissioning status update meeting with the uh, plant management on a weekly basis. We do on-site inspections at least quarterly, sometimes more often than that. And then we ask questions and follow up on issues on an as needed basis. As far as inspection results, uh, to date we've had one severity level four non-sited violation that was in the first quarter of this year. It was self-identified by the licensee by Holtec, uh, and they self-identified that they sent a type A package for disposal using the paperwork for another similar package. Uh, they entered that into their corrective action program, immediately notified the uh, receiver for that waste, the waste disposal site, and they sent the correct uh, waste manifest before the waste ever arrived at the disposal site. Uh, as part of our inspection activities, we investigated that, we uh, evaluated the corrective actions, we determined that it was of very low safety significance because the packaging and the proper shipping name were correct and therefore there was no impact on transportation safety. We also uh, identified that the corrective actions appeared to be appropriate uh, to the event and um, were completed. I'd also like to point out that um, we do make important observations and some of those observations may also be documented in inspection reports. Uh, for example, in the third quarter, we took a look at fire protection. We identified some concerns with the administrative uh, handling of hot work permits and of uh, combustible uh, material storage permits. We raised that up to the site management. They entered that into the corrective action program, and we did mention that in the inspection report. And that is all that I have for uh, prepared slides. Um, so, Tammy, I will send it back over to you. And, and Harry, you'll you, also Harry. you'll you'll also send us your slides, and uh, Tammy too. I hope. Yes, of course. Yep. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Any Anyone have any questions from the uh, NRC members here? Mary. Um, I really don't have a question, just a suggestion. I had asked uh, Bruce that you send the slides before the meeting, and unfortunately that didn't happen. I know everybody's busy, but if we don't get the slides first, A, I can't see them from here. It really impedes thinking about what questions uh, to ask. And so I think it would be more productive when you come again, which we hope you do, that you send the slides and written material well in advance to the panel. We could circulate it to the public so the meeting can be meaningful. Thank you very much. Fine. Thanks for the feedback, Mary. I have a question. I'm sorry, Mr. Priest, Jack? Yep. Uh, could could the NRC tell us when their next scheduled inspection module for uh, effluence is scheduled for? Harry, do you that? have any information on that? Uh, I just completed an inspection of effluence in the third quarter. I'll be back on site um, on December 13th. I'll be inspecting occupational radiation safety. 
So we do complete those core inspections every year. So in 2022, we will also inspect effluents as well. And uh, which quarter we inspect that in is really driven by plant activities. And so as the plant prepares uh, to do effluent, liquid effluent discharges, if that is the option that they select, uh, we would make sure to target our inspection activities to coincide with that. And thank uh, you. Okay, you're welcome. I, I, Fine. Yeah, Harry, I think uh, you mentioned uh, special nuclear materials. Could you tell us what special nuclear materials are since it all seems special to me? Uh, in general terms, special nuclear material is um, fissile material. So it's material of particular importance uh, in that it could be diverted for nefarious purposes. So in particular, uh, enriched uranium would be considered to be special nuclear material. There's a very, very technical definition. It's in the regulations. Uh, but the licensees are required to account for all of their special nuclear material. And there's uh, special procedures and special reports uh, that are written on an annual basis. Does that help? Almost. So okay. they're, they're materials that uh, in the wrong hands would, would threaten the general world as we know it. Are, are, can you like tell us what that is? I mean, how much of that is at Pilgrim, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's something that say NDCAP really has to concern itself with, or we can have absolute faith in the NRC and Holtec that no question, there's such a small amount of it and we've got it covered, um, it'll never be an issue. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I would answer that. A special nuclear material, again, would be material um, that is fissile. And if it is diverted and, uh, and altered in its form with technical knowledge, it could be used for, for nefarious purposes. We have regulations uh, to ensure that that does not happen. And there are regulations to ensure that uh, the form of the special nuclear material and the quantity of the special nuclear material would not facilitate its nefarious use. So um, I'm not sure I could really say too much more than that. I, I, I'm accepting that. I'm accepting that, Harry. Thank you. Pine, okay. there's, uh, Pine, there's a whole um, page with definitions and examples on the NRC's website for special nuclear material. So in Massachusetts, we're an agreement state for the non-power plant radioactive material license holders. We also have a category for special nuclear material. Uh, on my webpage, I also have um, that definition and ex examples of uh, the controls that are needed in place, uh, security plans, communication plans, things like that to uh, manage those. And for the non-power plant, they're uh, very small um, activity license holders in the state. So if you need some more information uh, of interest to you for that, I can help you uh, get that information. Thanks very much, Jeff. You're welcome. Uh, Henrietta, and then we'll take a question from the public. I hope this isn't a naive question, but I, I, I don't think you're talking about spent fuel per se, are you? You're not talking about spent fuel. You're talking about enriched uranium that is other than in the spent fuel. Uh, the spent fuel is part of the material control and accounting program. There is enriched uranium at small amounts in nuclear fuel. Okay, but is there other enriched uranium that is not part of the spent fuel is really what I'm asking. Yes, there are. Um, for example, there are nuclear detectors that use very small amounts of enriched uranium is part of the detection process for neutrons when the reactor is operating. Um, and so those discrete devices would also be included in the uh, Special Nuclear Material Control Program. I see, okay. Uh, question from the public, Mr. Richard Rothstein. 
Good evening, everybody. I have two regulatory questions from NRC's presentation. I guess the first had to do with the contents of the license uh, termination plan. And I think in terms of the environmental reports that were done previously, and if there were any significant changes, Amy, um, that needed to be documented, uh, um, what happens if there's some new state or more so federal um, regulations that came about or come about uh, between now and uh, the time of the plan submittal? Um, so um, would the uh, plan have to address the impact or potential impact of uh, new federal regu environmental regulations? That's one question, and I'll ask my second one after Amy answers. Okay. So um, if there are new federal regulations and they become promulgated, the new rules will usually describe, um, specify when those will be um, effective and if there's any grandfathering provisions. So it depends on the final rule. Um, and it also depends on when the licensee submits their application. So I can't be more specific than that other than those factors are considered, those three factors would have to be considered. Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question had to do with um, uh, the last presentation in terms of one slide discussed uh, considerations or uh, of the like for um, emergency plans for the IFSASI. And I can relate uh, in terms of uh, years in the past too about emergency response planning for an operating nuclear plant and seen the, the key parts of that had to do with uh, in the unlikely event of a Pilgrim radiological emergency, um, the emergency plan needing to address um, evacuation versus shelter in place. Uh, and uh, now that the, uh, well, the um, zones have been reduced down to the site boundary, um, and I guess the all hazards plan uh, comes into play in terms of the state involvement there. But um, can you summarize what the primary difference of an emergency plan for an incident uh, entails versus uh, an operating nuclear plant. What are we looking at now or should be looking at now uh, in terms of uh, the infancy that may not have existed in terms of an emergency plan for an operating nuclear plant? Okay. Well, for an operating nuclear plant, there was an amendment that was approved um, a while back, um, I think right before uh, license transfer, right after and that has that had to do with when the um, reactor is no longer operating, so it permanently ceased operations. So there was an amendment to address the um, requirements for related to emergency response for those accidents that could occur based on an operating reactor. And at that point in time, the um, commission had to approve the change in the plan if it had to do with the emergency planning zone. So that's one thing that happened a while back. At this juncture, what the application was all about was when the, all the fuel is removed from the spent fuel pool, then all of those requirements and those accident sequence that relate to maintaining the spent fuel pool um, are no longer applicable. So the, the emergency scheme, there, there still is one, but the ones that apply to the spent fuel pool are no longer applicable. And in the amendment um, application and in our safety evaluation, it has a red line strike out and it shows the difference between before and after the spent fuel pool is uh, spent, the spent fuel is removed from the pool. So there is still an emergency 
action level scheme. It's just changed because those safety um, accident sequences no longer apply anymore. And I can I can provide you the um, reference number to the staff safety evaluation, which you can see the changes. Um, so in short, um, hi, Richard. Richard, in short, um, oh. we, it no longer requires sirens. There's no 10 mile EPZ and there's no stockpiling of potassium, uh, potassium iodide. Right, I, I appreciate I appreciate and understand all of that. Thank you. I'm just trying to get a, a handle on maybe a couple elements that might apply to an IFC pad with storage spent nuclear fuel in the casks. Um, you know, notwithstanding that we don't have an operating reactor, so things are different. As uh, uh, both of you just enumerated there, can you can you cite uh, what you'd like to see in an NFC emergency plan, a couple of elements there that would be strictly for an NFC facility, just so the panel and public know what to be looking for? Um, well, <clears throat> one of the things um, that has changed is that the um, incident response commander had the position has changed to the ISPC um, shift supervisor and um, then the um, health physics tech um, uh, has um, has I think two or four hours to report to the um, in, to the ISPC ship supervisor who is trained in all of those requirements, um, but it because an ISPC ship supervisor is required to be at the site 24/7, 365 days a year. That position takes on those responsibilities. Yeah, I get I, 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 I just my final comment. What I'm driving at is my sense is that uh, safety and security is probably the driver that would affect any emergency planning at, you know, on an IFC pad. So there may be certain elements of uh, Rich Grassy could probably address this a lot better being a professional in that area. But uh, nevertheless, there must be some link between safety, security, and emergency plan uh, considerations, but that could be the subject of another discussion at another time. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Rich. Uh, Jim Lampert. Jim Lampert. Hopefully very quick questions. I guess the first one is for Ms. Snyder. At one point in your presentation, you referred to something. Make sure your microphone is turned off. Can't hear you. There it is. At one point in your presentation, there were a couple of submissions to the NRC that you mentioned. You said that one of them was simply checked to see if all the pieces were there. At a later point in your presentation, you talked about the license termination plan and referred to some technical reviews. And I guess my question is, with respect to the latter one, where we have those technical reviews, are those substantive reviews or are they simply to make sure that the pieces are there? Who are you speaking to, me? So, yeah, I think Amy? you mentioned this in your presentation. <laughs> right. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes, I can. Mute. Thank you. You had it first, Amy. You, then you muted yourself. Okay. There you okay. go. Okay. Let me. Um, that's a very good question for all submittals for uh, licensing actions. Um, we do an acceptance review, and so what that means is we look at the application to make sure that it has the uh, a complete submittal because we do not start a detailed technical review until we uh, do that check because it, it really is something that um, is not uh, efficient. 
and uh, we do not want to have multiple rounds of continual multiple rounds of requests for additional information. Um, so that's a, a process for all licensing um, amendments. Once it's accepted for detailed technical review, then that is that review is done um, substantially and it's both um, a safety review and an environmental review. Could you expand a little on what the staff does to get into a substantive review after acceptance? Um, yes, well, it depends on the um, application. So I'm, I'm, for, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the final termination report, license right. termination. Right, so for final termination plan review, it would involve a health physicist review, um, a groundwater review, depending on the, bound, the condition of the site, if there's groundwater, potable groundwater, um, past history of contamination. So groundwater, um, a uh, performance analyst, and that is someone who looks at the um, the evaluation that the licensee has done for um, determining the cleanup criteria, uh, the final uh, dose assessment. So that's done by modeling usually. So a modeler or performance analyst would do that type of review. Um, a financial analyst would look at the decommissioning cost estimate piece. A um, environmental reviewer would look at the environmental report or any supplement information in, that um, has to do with the environmental report. Just one, quite one more question on this subject. In making those det more detailed reviews, what information, other than information that's provided by the licensee, does the staff get into? Well, uh, we'd have to do our independent review, independent analysis. So um, we will look at um, we will look at what the applicant submits, and then um, we have to independently do our own assessment and confirm or um, decide if uh, it's acceptable or we may do a different analysis to see if it's our analysis, if, it, if their analysis is um, acceptable from a standpoint of bounding the, um, the risks and or the um, cleanup levels. I guess I wasn't completely clear. What I was really wondering is what information, other than information that is provided by the applicant, the licensee, does the staff look for, search for, or investigate? <laughs> you, so you, you do go outside the licensee's submission for information? If we need to, we will. Okay. Okay. And then I think I had a question for, uh, I guess it was for Harry. And this is with respect to a security inspection. It's a letter dated July 12th, 2021. And it refers several times to the ISC2 protected area. Is that simply the area inside the fence? Uh, I'll do my best. I am not a security inspector, and we often have to tread lightly because some aspects of the uh, security uh, are not publicly disclosable. Um, but in general terms, uh, that, that would appear to be the case, yes. So I guess what that leads me to is if this is a security, to what extent does your practice or regulation in looking at security look at such things as the 300 yards between the fence and the public Rocky Hill Road. And I don't want any details, but is that, that type, is that included in your security analysis? 
Well, again, I'm not a security inspector, but I am somewhat familiar with um, the programs. And uh, the security program does include a threat assessment. I don't think that I could really speak to more than that in a public forum. And, and would a threat assessment include the threat of, say, a terrorist attack from outside the protected area using what I understand to be quite readily available weapons that are capable of penetrating the casks? I could not speak to that. I'm sorry. OK. Then I guess I just had one final. I'm not sure who this is for. I have in front of me the OIG's audit of the NRC's oversight of the adequacy of decommissioning trust funds. The report, I'm not telling you anything, is not entirely laudatory. It pointed out some deficiencies, and I was just wondering if you could tell us what has been done to address those deficiencies. <clears throat> I have this one. So thanks for the question. Yes, we are aware of the OIG audit um, review of decommissioning trust fund. Uh, we approved, we, we agreed with their recommendations um, and that will be to improve process controls for status reports, ensuring that they are complete and have go undergone the appropriate review process. Um, we will develop and implement improved process controls to ensure annual reviews of decommissioning trust fund reports are completed in a timely manner and have undergone the proper review process. We will develop and implement a tracking system to track the status of both the annual decommissioning trust fund and the, re um, and the report analysis. Um, and then we will engage with the appropriate regulators to evaluate options for ensuring periodic assessment of trustee compliance with the master trust fund restrictions in the regulations. And then we will put in place appropriate protocols and procedures for implementing those new um, trustee compliance actions. So we Do I did gather agree that those new, excuse me, go ahead. We did, we did uh, agree with their findings and we have responded to them. And what I, I read to you was what our intentions to do are to address those. In addition, the, the decommissioning trust fund mm -hmm. is reviewed during routine decommissioning inspections as part of inspection procedure uh, 71801. Jim, we got to, uh, we got other people. And by when do you expect to have all of those improvements actually in effect? That's my last question. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that. I was just wondering, I'm gathering these are in process, by when do you expect to have all of these improvements in effect and working? That's a very good question. I don't have when we have them all. Uh, I know we are starting on the first two, which are improved process controls, um, clearly uh, putting together, developing and implementing a tracking system may take a little bit more time. And then um, in where we have to interact with your other regulators to evaluate options is probably even going to take a little bit longer. I can, we can get that information back to you, but I don't have a uh, succinct answer on when that would be complete. Great, thank you very much. All right, fine. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have a question. I'm, I'm not able to allow Rosemary Shields into the room, but she has a question. Um, two questions, actually, one for Harry and uh, one for Amy, if you can stick by just a little bit longer. Um, uh, Harry, um, Rosemary is asking um, relative to the half inch shield core um, of the dry casks. I think she's talking about the canisters. How often are the dry casks being inspected for leakage? And as the casks age, is there a plan to inspect the casks more often? Oh, I apologize. I couldn't answer those. Uh, the IFC inspection is a, a very specialized inspection, and we bring in inspectors uh, that have a special qualification to do that. Um, so I don't have that information in front of me. Okay. Um, is there somebody we should approach at, at the NRC for, for that answer? that you can reveal their contact info or maybe send it to us later? <laughs> Anyone? Uh, it looks like uh, Tammy, you your know, screen may be- If you're talking, you're on mute. Excuse me? 
I have the information, what the documents are. I could send them to you. I'll, fo I'll follow up with Neil, um, Rosemary. For Amy, um, Amy, as a member of the public who is not up on NRC terminology, but she is an illegal women voter, so um, could you could you tell us the significance of a 2027 termination of license? Does it mean that Holtec no longer has the license and is free to leave the premises? No. Um, uh 2027 termination of the part 50 um, license excluding the ISFACY for um, Pilgrim, they have a general ISFACY license. So what that means is it's under the part 50 license. So the, um, the portion of the site that Holtec wants to partial site release, they'll have to identify those boundaries and that whole portion they'll have to uh, have submitted final status survey reports that uh, follow the license termination plan. The NRC has to write a separate safety evaluation report for each of those survey units. And then um, the licensee has to submit a request for license termination of whatever portion they want to have released. At that point in time, there'll be a, um, the boundary will be shrunk to whatever the licensee asked for if we approve it. They will also still have to continue with the offsite insurance. Um, for um, which they're required to have now on-site and off-site, but they uh, will still be required to have the off-site insurance until the spent fuel is removed from the site. And then the um, ISFACI itself, will they'll have to submit a plan for decommissioning the ISFACI in a similar process where final status remediation if need be, final status survey and termination of that portion of the site. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, I did get a chat back from uh, Neil who uh, gave us a link uh, regarding the license termination for Humboldt Bay plant in California. There's a, a link on the nrc.gov website in their reading room collection news um, from uh, and and then slash after news 2021 slash 21 dash zero five one. Uh, it's a press Great. release that provides that provides a high level description of what it involves, which includes unrestricted release of the site other than the its facility. Okay, and I just want to mention for Humboldt Bay, it has a specific Part 72 license, so. The, um, the part 72 license is, uh, remains in effect. In Pilgrim's case, they don't have a specific part 72 or ISFACI license. It's a general license under the part 50, uh, but it's the same concept. Thank you. And Jack Priest is reminding us that they'll also have to meet the requirements of the mass settlement agreement. So uh, NRC has been very kind to us tonight. We really pre appreciate they have to go. Um, excuse me, Pine. You said the public could ask questions and I assumed that the panel could ask questions afterwards before the NRC leaves. That's why I actually didn't ask any questions. Well, that's why it's, that's why it's on the agenda. Uh, Diane, you get a quick question? I just want to follow up with Jim. Um, the um, Office of the Inspector General um, said that the NRC doesn't enforce compliance with regulations of the decommissioning trust fund restrictions, and that would cause an increased risk of fraud, waste, or misuse of the decommissioning trust funds. Is the NRC aware that Holtec has already been charged and found guilty of bribery and fraud in the United States? 
All right, Di Diane, Diane, what? do you have a simple on-topic question? That's my question. This is the OIG report, and this is what they said. So I'm just asking, do they know that Holtec has been found guilty of fraud and bribery? That's a, my question. NRC? I guess not. Um, I think we uh, lost Tammy. And uh, so huh. all I could say is, is that the handling of the decommissioning trust fund would be uh, a headquarters function. I'm not sure that there's anybody here that could answer that. For right. Me. Okay. And I'll send it, there's documents on that too. And I just, just quickly, Pat, um, when 2027, the release of the property, does that involve the area where the reactor site is right now? It potentially could, yes. Okay. Because like Diane, um, Diane, just, uh, just the NRC uh, said a school at elementary school could be uh, built on the site, and so I was just wondering, do you agree with that? Uh, an elementary school could be built with a Pilgrim reactor is right now. Just wondering. I think the high tide would prevent it. Huh? Uh, the NRC. The uh, we can't make a decision now because they have not submitted the application. We haven't done the evaluation, but in general, if a licensee meets the unrestricted release criteria, then uh, they, we don't have, it's unrestricted. So anything could be done on that site as far as the requirements for NRC. Okay, so there's no restrictions of anything near the- That's what unrestricted release, release means. Mm -hmm. As, long, right, as long as the sea level doesn't rise, you can build anything there. Okay, wow, but it's right yeah. next to the dump. I, I think the zoning commit to uh, the town zoning uh, laws would have something to say of how that would be redeveloped. All right, Jack, thank you. I just want to uh, thank everyone who's still listening, uh, who's still on the meeting with, from the NRC and <laughs> taking your time out tonight to participate. And um, it was very enlightening. And uh, hopefully, maybe we'll have you back uh, maybe in 2022 sometime. Enjoy your holiday. <laughs> Um, so I assume the panel can ask any questions, although the agenda specifically says item six, panel comments and questions. I'm just objecting. Or object. All right, moving on to the next agenda item. Discussion on the role of the DOE in the spent nuclear fuel storage dilemma. No, it's already the NRC. So, uh, so this, uh, this afternoon, I participated in the call, which went on for, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes. It was set up by uh, Mr. Jackman um, out of Congressman Keating's office. It was very informative. Um, Mike, you still there? Yep, I'm here, John. All right, thank God we didn't lose you. Okay. I uh, thank you for uh, participating tonight uh, and setting that up. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but... Um, I uh, just want to have a few comments about that, Mike. Sure. So we had reached out to the Department of Energy um, to see if we could have a dialogue um, and get some input about an issue that was discussed at the last meeting, the issue of the possibility of nuclear fuel reprocessing. And we uh, did have a discussion um, with uh, some technical staff from the Office of Nuclear Energy who are working on that issue. Um, I, I guess um, I'll leave it to you and Pine to uh, give your perspectives. But from what I heard from the discussion, it's um, it's uh, ongoing, but in the future, and not something that we could um, look to as a near-term solution for the um, uh, ultimate fate of the on-site uh, spent fuel at Pilgrim. Um, but we, we're going to keep those discussions going and try to get some more insights. Um, we heard a lot about economic models and how it's handled in other countries and um, how why it's not uh, viable at this time. I guess there's a question about the viability at this time. Um, so I, I don't know if, if you or Pine have any um, comments on that part of the discussion. I, I enjoyed the call, Mike, I thank you again for setting that up. I certainly, I think we left it at, there would be a subsequent call maybe in early January. Yep. And certainly 
Uh, I'd love to have a couple of those members uh, be here brick and mortar in person to the January meeting or the following meeting in the spring of 22, because I thought that it added tremendous yeah. value. Obviously, philosophically, yeah. what they're talking about and you know, everybody always uh, references France. Uh, there's a subsidy there from the, uh, the national government in that country. And obviously that doesn't exist over here yet. So um, with respect to the viability of uh, being profitable on, you know, in this endeavor. So it's also illegal in the United States to reprocess fuel. <laughs> yeah, so there's multiple hurdles to get over. Jack, thank you. I'll give it to Pine. The the other um, point of interest uh, that the um, that the staffers brought up was that um, there's there's a uh, imminently there will be another invitation to uh, for the public to comment on interim uh, waste storage uh, as an addendum basically to the 2017 report that was done. So you can look for, it almost sounded like days to me that, uh, that an advertisement and press release would come out seeking public comment on that. Um, they seem to have other ideas about consent-based um, uh, interim storage facilities um, and looking for ways to, um, to do that in such a way that it is more attractive than formally um, for communities to consider that. Um, so I, I think that for that reason, it was also inter an interesting discussion. What I did learn a lot, we talked somewhat about the, the small nuclear reactors as well. Um, and uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of energy in the Department of Energy for that kind of thing. So it's something that I would like to bring back to the panel um, in the future, uh, not necessarily eminently, um, but, uh, um, but there's a lot in process that will affect our site and the storage of the ISTACY and uh, the, the nuclear waste that's there. I think coupled with the order um, that came down from, uh, or, or the, the AG's um, letter to, to Holtec today relative to the barge uh, facility, I think there's a lot for us to talk about. There was also a report um, in, from the NRC relative, or from the DOE relative to uh, transportation that I found, you know, um, uh, delivered a reality check in terms of um, how difficult, how much has to be done in order for the waste to leave the site. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us to wrap our brains around that um, yeah. and, to, and to try to figure out how to, um, how to be realistic about what to expect as well as how to have the best thing happen. Mm -hmm. So look forward in the future. Um, and thank Mike, thanks again very much for- um, um, could, could the panel uh, make a few comments? That this, uh, I, this is uh, sure, Mary, a group effort. And also Henrietta had her hand up. Uh, what I would like, Mike, is a focus on the, the near term, what DOE is doing um, in regard to R&D on safer on-site storage. I will note that DOE uh, updated its technology gaps. And what was important was they changed the priority of stress corrosion cracking risks of thin walled canisters to a priority one. Uh, also, they added a new DOE technology gap to assess radiological impact of through wall canister cracks, raised the priority of a need to have the ability to transfer fuel to another storage container. Now, these are very important for the now. And so I would hope that you would discuss that uh, with equal, if not, I feel far more priority. And also, uh, as far as Congress goes, to be funding this technological research, which is so key. And thank, thank you and the Congressman always 
and our senators for the good work you're doing. But our priority for this panel, I know there's disagreement, is site assessment, the now, and safer spent fuel storage now. And I hope that's all we'll do next year. Mary, I, I'm certainly open to any questions, comments, um, requests for information that the panel has for the Office of Nuclear Energy on any, any of these topics. Um, we can certainly uh, tr get, the, get a response to any of those questions ahead of the meeting in January. And um, as, as we discussed, uh, it was mentioned the possibility of having someone from the office attend, if not in January, a subsequent meeting to comment on all these topics. So happy to, happy to take those in and pass those questions along. Thank you, Mary, by the way, because I was going to say something along those lines. Um, I have a follow-up question, which is not unrelated. A follow-up question really to Rosemary Shields' comments uh, about, or query about the, about the schedule for inspections. Um, we know that we have these thin-walled canisters and we know that they're warranted for only 25 years and that with in a, in a marine environment, both stainless steel and cement corrode faster than they would in another environment. And so my question, given all of the other uncertainties that we are dealing with, uh, my question is, who can walk us through what happens when a cask starts to leak or five casks start to leak? Uh, what what happens then? Um, it's likely to happen before these canisters go anywhere. And right now there is, as I understand it, no technology for repair of casks, except for a short-term repair. And there is no technology for actually taking a leaking cask and either, uh, and, and transferring it into a leaking container and transferring it into a, a safer, a safer situation. My understanding is that it is really dependent on, we, we're not going to have the reactor building, we're not going to have the fuel pool, so there's nothing to put these containers into safely. Uh, so my understanding is that it's either hot dry cell technology or something as yet unknown. And the state of hot cell technology is not very advanced yet, there isn't anything available to us. So let's just suppose 10 years from now, 10 years from now, a cask starts to leak. Seriously, a weld or five welds fail, then what? And I'm not sure this is a question for- So are you asking rhetorically or are you directing no, this No, not at all. This is the high, so, so I mean, who, this is our- Who lives. are you directing the question to? I'm asking to, I'm asking it of anybody who can walk us through it. And I don't know whether that's Pat or someone from the NRC or someone from the DOE, but it's an important question, which we have skirted around for four or five years and nobody has ever answered this question. It needs to be answered. It's really important. Is That's a not a rhetorical question. We've, we've had our experts speak to this panel before and talk to this. I can see if I can get them back again, but- No, no, we, I mean, spoken this, to this. The, this is- You haven't had a cask leak anywhere in the industry. No, no, I know. Cask storage is up over 20 years. Yeah. You know, so, so you're talking about something that's hypothetical. No, well, and no, I've, said, not... I've said many times in that response, whatever the anomaly may be, if it is identified, mm -hmm you would address it and make sure that the casket's back in compliance. You have to understand what the anomaly is before you would figure out the solution. Sure, but let's, let's suppose that it, at, this is hypothetical only if you assume, if you make all kinds of assumptions that these casks are actually invulnerable, but of course they are not, which is why they're only warranted for 25 years. So um, let's suppose that they are not in, that, that they are leaking 10 years from now or 15 years from now, call it 20 if you want, I don't care. 
we may not be around, but our children and our grandchildren will be around, perhaps. I still want to know what happens, how, and, and I don't want, I, of course, it, I don't know what's going to fail, but I think most likely it would be the welds. Welds are more vulnerable than other parts high, of the high, Highly unlikely, but you've seen the welding technology that does the automated welds and what those look like. But why don't we get Dr. Swing up here? I yeah, I mean, really, it's just a, I, like I said. I have I have cancer experts. I will talk to them and I, see what I can. I'm, come I'm up. sure. I'm, I'm sure there. there's. We've had Dr. Good, Anton and we've had Joy Russell here before. I just spoken to this panel multiple times it, on this. A lot, and they never answered that question at all. Okay. They always said it's highly unlikely, but that's just not an adequate answer. Surely you can understand. It's not. Uh, that's why we have emergency. That's planning. what emergency planning is all about. So um, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask this question, even if you think of it as hypothetical, it's actually inevitable because these casks are not made forever. Even if they last for hundred years, highly unlikely, but even if they do, it's still a problem. What then happens? Anyone else? So. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Jackman. Yeah, I just want to also um, point out that uh, my colleague Ben Thomas from Senator Markey's office is on the call, and he and I have been going back and forth about um, our call today with the ONE. So I know Senator Markey's office will also do all they can to uh, engage with uh, DOE to get the uh, questions, 20 answers that folks have, including questions about any studies or R&D around uh, cast technology. I, I appreciate that, Mike, and um, certainly whatever we can do to uh, hopefully get, uh, get a couple of those individuals that participated in that call today to get up here in January. I'd love to have that happen. Okay. Does um, okay. does Ben want to come on and introduce himself or say anything? Hello, hi, this is Ben Thomas. I'm the regional director for the Senator for the 9th Congressional District. Been listening in and texting with Mike, as he said, um, and we are very, very happy to be a resource uh, for whatever the committee and panel needs, um, along with Congressman Keating's office. And um, we would be also be happy to come back in the future and talk about the set, some of the Senator's legislation uh, related to these topics, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. And Thanks, Ben, for joining us tonight. Anybody else? Not you, anything else? Can you wrap up about where you are? Sure. I have a draft. I have a draft uh, that is formatted. I've covered the schedule. Um, I've got information from Pat today on the DTF. I've reviewed all the minutes and summarized them except for October and November, or September and November, excuse me. Um, and I'm just waiting for input from Seth and I'll talk to him after the meeting on it. Um, as soon as we get that input, uh, we'll have a complete draft. There are maybe other things you'll want to address, John and Pine. Um, just let me know. Okay. So, would you would you suggest a time frame, um, the kind of thing that we could send around to the panel for review and get their feedback well, a, before we? That's dependent upon it. when I get Seth's material. Yes. I integrate it into what I've got right now. Um, for example, one thing I've done is taken all the minutes, summaries, and yep. put them in an appendix, get it out of there so we can have a nice, clean 20, 25-page report. Yeah, that sounds good. So so you figured a couple of weeks we might be able to have something that... that a couple we of weeks from when? From uh, next Monday. Again, depending upon Seth's input... <laughs> Yeah, sure. If I get Seth's input before then, yes. I mean, literally, if we're going to be able to let anyone review it before, it's due by the end of 
December, so we kind of have a deadline. I don't know if anybody I'm else. I'm being a good state. listener, Hi. I, I don't know if anybody in the, uh, the state lives with those deadlines, but. Well, it's just something else I'm coming up to speed on. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll talk to. Awesome. And, and for, for everybody's we'll, sake, we'll, this is we'll, a, we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah, this is a the annual report is required by legislation that we deliver it to the uh, governor and to the legislature by the end of the year. When? By the end of the year, you know, December 31st, the end of the year, that part. Before the meeting ends, I'd like to make a few motions. All right, go ahead, Mary. Oh, okay. Uh, I've spent a lot of time reading the agendas of the Vermont uh, NDCAP and New York's NDCAP, et cetera. And I was particularly impressed by uh, Vermont's. And I encourage uh, you look at their agendas, et cetera. Uh, they too, which I regret, uh, meet just every other month. I think that's a mistake. I would like to make a motion that we go back to for 2022 to meeting once a month and that the meetings be both virtual to accommodate, particularly those in the state and the Cape and around uh, so they could participate and also meetings in person. And the reason I say that is that the next couple of years, the name of the game is to assess and make recommendations on site cleanup and on site spent fuel start. That is the name of the game. And I know our legislation pointed out that one of the jobs of the NDCAP is a conduit for public information and, educa and education on and to encourage community involvement in matters related to decommissioning. And you are not getting community involvement. And I think in part, uh, going to every other month uh, is a deterrent to community involvement. And you will expand community involvement and maybe get the press and get more of our politicians, elected officials to learn about it and uh, join the chorus of interest. So motion number one is to meet for 2022 once a month, both and the meetings are both in person and online. That's motion number one. I have a couple of more. Anyone? All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Go second. Okay, discussion of the motion. Anyone have any discussion on the motion to start 2022 off by going to monthly meetings? Yeah, go ahead, Richard. When you check the, uh, the last time I checked the Vermont NDCAP, it was meeting on a quarterly basis. Have they changed that? Uh, no, as I did say in my quote preamble that I regretted that they met every other month. Thank you. And so if they, uh, if the motion falls for a meeting every, every month, then I'll make a motion for every other month and then have some qualifications. All right, a few comments on the motion. So as you know, I served on the local select board here for 12 years. In the early part of this last decade in the 2012, 2013 range, I had a colleague on the local select board in Plymouth who tried to start an initiative of building a coalition of the 104 communities in, the, in, in America that have uh, you know, a, a nuclear power plant, whether it be fully operational or offline and the spent fuel is sitting there, trying to build a coalition to 
somehow get everybody together going forward and maybe in a perfect world affect some sort of change at the uh, down in Washington, DC. We, we couldn't get, you couldn't get one of the other 103 communities to pick up the phone or send you an email. Um, so the notion that if we went back to monthly meetings, you would get more participation from the public is, I mean, it's just pie in the sky. It's not going to happen. Well, I think when we had it once a month initially uh, in the intermediate school, it was, it was quite full. Mm -hmm. All right, so, I, what, I, so what's happened? I, well, I think it was the, it was the novelty of the whole thing. It was brand new. You're coming into year one. Um, you know, some other variables came into play there. Uh, you saw our, um, Andrew G make a move. Whole tech came on the scene. There was some, uh, certainly there was some activity around the, uh, the transferring of the license. Um, you know, myself and, uh, yes. And now Ms. Dubois is saying COVID, the, the pandemic. So you're just not gonna, you're not, whatever it is you're seeing for participation from the public, it's just not going to happen. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Even when the plant was online, I could run into people in the community that had no idea there was a nuclear power plant here. Mm -hmm. So I, I certainly, I mean, I could, I could continue, but I don't, I don't support the motion. Well, obviously I do support it because I think to satisfy our mandate to get involvement of the public and to educate them by meeting less seems to be a contradiction. Any, anyone else? Mr. Under Chairman? The, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Pickering. Could we possibly table the vote until at least the next NDCAP meeting? I mean, I, I honestly, uh, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to be able to reach out to um, my contacts at EEA um, to get their opinion on this before I vote on it as their representative. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, does Ms. Lampert want to withdraw her motion and uh, revisit it in January? As long as it's revisited in January, I, I certainly am accommodating on it. All right, so if Ms. Uh, Constantino can uh, withdraw her second. Sure. Okay, and then uh, Ms. Dubois and myself, it won't, it'll be an agenda item in January. Okay, and I also have another motion that the meetings, whether they be every other month or once a month be for three hours. They're too short. And what happens typically is public comment. And tonight, panel comment is uh, not given the opportunity to be able to develop further uh, whatever um, our guests may have to say, to ask questions, to make comment, to make it a learning and meaningful experience for the public and for other panel members. Otherwise, I feel like we're treated part of the time like small babies in a nest with our mouths open to be fed without the opportunity to go further. It's the follow-up questions that make it meaningful. Uh, three hours uh, was possible in, in Vermont, and particularly if it's going to be online for those who have to drive, uh, and also in person. And I don't see any Cinderella's in the audience. <laughs> All right, so you're making a motion. The motion or do you, do is that the meetings be three hours and not uh, scheduled from 630. All right, so should that be part of the agenda item in January when we revisit, when we discuss whether we want to go monthly? Well, would, would you have to discuss this with uh, your boss? Or is it, you know, an extra three, three hours make a difference? Uh, Mary, uh, so you can make a motion if you want. I, I just say we, we wrap both issues into one agenda item in January. That's what I would suggest. Okay, I'll go along with it, but I'm not going along. I'm not gonna can the next one, which is that public comment period 
should be, there should be two at every meeting, in the middle and at the end. Yes. All right, du duly noted. Yes. Okay, and we'll have an agenda item on those two points that you wanted to make in January. There are three. Monthly, three hours. What was the second one? Two, the two public comment things? Two public comments. Okay. Mm -hmm. Diane. We have to ask Tech TV. I don't know if they can do it. I can I can see it um, and and monitor it. I said no, but I but I and and you know halfway through I can allow people to talk. But at the beginning I couldn't. I think we we're just having some technical problems. I'm not sure. It's better not to do it. But yeah, there were so there's 31 participants now. They were in the NRC was here. Okay, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. So you know um, what, if there were 35, John. Excuse me? If there were 35 people on, I think you might reconsider your comments that nobody cares. Yeah. I didn't say that. There's a difference between how many are public well, and how many are staff. There's pretty large staff contingency on these two. All right, motion on the floor to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your holidays. Yes. You're welcome, Rich. And thanks for all the work that you do.